Next item. Renaming of Bon Petit at MBCC, Ms. Shannon Peterson and Dr. Winfred Green. Good evening again. I have the easy part. I just have to introduce them. So tonight we have Dr. Winifred Green. She's the principal of STEM, Magna, DCMST, and Michael Berry Center. We have Mr. Osama Beydoun, who is the assistant principal of STEM, Magna, DCMST, and the Michael Berry Career Center. Dr. John Barrow, who is our CTE Perkins supervisor. And Chef Karen Pokrivke, who is wonderful with the kids. Um, and they have a request regarding Bon Appetit. Thank you very much, Ms. Peterson, and good evening, Dr. Maleko, President Thorpe, and trustees. Again, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here this evening to speak to you about the possible renaming of the restaurant at the Michael Berry Center. It is with great pleasure for me to make this recommendation, as before her passing and her retirement, Eleanor Shepard was extremely dedicated to her field of hospitality management and culinary arts. She had this dedication and passion while at the Wheel Inn at Fordson High School, and she brought that same passion and dedication to Bon Appetit Student Restaurant at the Michael Berry Center. With that being said, the possibility of naming the Bon Appetit in her, in her honor is very exciting. Again, thank you for this opportunity, and we have a short presentation. First would be Dr. Byrle to continue this brief presentation. Thank you, John. Thank you. Hi, members of the board, thank you. It's, it's me again, fully vaccinated, so I'll take my mask off. Um, so we are here today to, to talk to you about renaming the restaurant. I think many of you have been there and, and seen what we do there. So I'm gonna go through this fairly quick and then Chef Karen here is available. She's been the one on the ground kind of doing this, so she'll be you know, available to answer questions. Um, so just a little bit of background. We have had a culinary arts program for uh, more than 25 years uh, going back. The original restaurant was the Wheel Inn. Many of you have fond memories of it and, and Ellie cooking lunch and Friday buffets over in Fordson in what's now the, the Academy's office. Um, in 2006, when we opened the Michael Berry Career Center, the Wheel Inn came over. I mean, physically, they picked up all the equipment and moved it over there. Um, at that time, there was a real uh, push towards sort of chef school and fine dining, sort of in the French tradition. And so the restaurant was renamed um, the Bon Appetit. And the curriculum was kind of towards that, that kind of very narrow focus, that sort of fine dining, five-star Michelin restaurant preparation. Um, and ran very successfully on that model under Ellie's leadership for, for very many years. Um, a little bit further, as Ellie retired, Chef Shepard in 2017, Chef Karen Pekrivke came on, who came to us from the college program. She is an instructor there as well, and so created that transition between our high school program and the Henry Ford College program. And as you know, that's our bachelor's degree program that turned us from a community college into a college. Um, so very important to maintain that, that connection and, and that pathway for our students into that. Um, as she came on and has been watching the trends in the world around us, um, there was a real shift away from that, again, very narrow, focused fine dining to a more broad, um, sort of casual dining or preparing kids for many careers, you know, the, the cruise ship, the entertainment industry. And, and let's face it, we're in Dearborn. We, we've got more than a handful of really good restaurants that aren't fine dining, but are the finest dining you'll ever find, correct? Um, and so there's been sort of a change in what we teach kids to do, focusing on not maybe just purely classical techniques and, and being more practical and preparing kids for a, a broader sense of careers. Um, so Karen has also brought that same, you know, passion and working with her students and respect for her students, whatever that Ellie did. Um, just as a background thing, unfortunately, shortly after she retired, um, Ms. Shepard, Ellie did pass away. Um, and then the last part, you know, obviously we did not operate last year, you know, not only with the district's COVID restrictions, you've seen what's going on in restaurants and everything around us. Um, so we're, we're at a tipping point. And as we go forward and get ready to reopen that program, 
under Dr. Maleko's guidance, you know, we are really forging ahead, full speed ahead with returning to face-to-face -face instruction. And hopefully, based on the health department guidance, opening that restaurant, you know, to the public in some manner next year. Um, so twice a year, Karen will meet, as is required by all of our career and tech ed programs, with our advisory committee. They were obviously over Zoom the last two years, but many of you I know I've seen at our advisory meetings we do over at Michael Berry. We pack that building full of community members. Um, we feed them dinner, often from Karen. Um, and the purpose of those meetings is to have our community members advise us on our program. You know, are you teaching them curriculum that's relevant? Are there new trends that we need to be aware of? And it's really forging a partnership or a bond between those, those local uh, businesses and our career and tech ed programs. And so something that's come up is this ongoing discussion as Karen has sort of evolved that restaurant into that broader, sort of more casual, more, you know, much like Ellie, kind of light and airy and welcoming kind of place, um, that maybe it was time to sort of rebrand the restaurant. And that's the term we used for a long time. Should we rebrand? Should we get a different logo? Should we paint the walls? Um, and that discussion has gone on through multiple ones of these meetings. Um, and somewhere in there, the idea of possibly renaming the restaurant in honor of Ellie Shepard, who put all those years in. And you know, to be honest, a lot of our advisory members are her ex-students going back 25 plus years. Um, so that has come through, and I know Karen has more of the details, but I know it's been an ongoing point of discussion in more than two or three or four of these uh, meetings. Um, and so we've kind of come up with the idea of kind of doing that, doing them both at the same, rebranding it, and then maybe incorporating something to honor Ellie in there. Um, these were some of our advisory, whatever, renaming committee, the people who broke off and sort of talked about this. Uh, but as I said, many of you have seen what we do. There's, if I tried to list everybody, it'd be a novel because so many people have come through there. Um, in a large part, students in the program, um, students who participate in our advisory committees, some of our student ambassadors, our student leaders have all uh, pitched in. And, and often they you know, will share, and, and alumni students will share those memories of Ellie. So definitely the students had a large part in, in this discussion as we go forward. So our proposal after lengthy discussion and several second place uh, things was to rename the Bon Appetit to Ellie's Eatery, kind of following a trend with eateries in general being common right now, um, as a more fast, casual, you know, friendly, welcoming, kind of light and airy thing. Um, and then the idea is maybe work with some of our design students throughout the district about coming up with that new logo and some stuff again I think it's a little too early to say definitively what we're going to do in October next year, but the plan is to at some point have some kind of uh, grand reopening, you know, kicking off Ellie's eatery, maybe doing a little quick remembrance of her and sort of welcoming the public back in. Um, so that's what we're proposing is just kind of do that. And again, Chef Karen can step up with me if you have any questions. We would glad, gladly field those. Any questions or comments? Trustee McDonald. Yes, I think this is a long time coming and it's a fantastic idea, not only in keeping up with times and trends and uh, the needs of our students, but also as an homage to um, Chef Eleanor Shepard. But I also wanna say, I have gone to, um, to Bon Appetit many times. I've taken family members for lunch there on many occasions. It's wonderful. The community is not aware of it. They don't know. And if you go to look up Bon Appetit online, you get a culinary arts magazine. You get all these other things. And it's really hard to find our gem of a restaurant at the Michael Berry Center. So I think this is just outstanding. I think it's tremendous that we're going to uh, name it after uh, Chef Shepard. And I am 100% on board with this. And I want to thank everyone that has put in such a time and effort into making that such a gem. And we do need to let the community know about it. It is an excellent way for our students to gain um, skills in the culinary arts industry. I agree. Thank you. Trustee Moser. I think Trustee Barry had a question. No? I think it was just signaling um, me for Trustee Moser. Are we going to recognize Chef um, Shepard? in some way or form in front of the restaurant? 
Uh, I think when we talk about that grand reopening, again, that's the plan. I, I'm just, you know, under Dr. Malako's guidance, like I said, we're all going ahead, but we don't know what August is going to bring. So we're, we're kind of waiting to flesh out the details on that until we have some better guidance on what we can and cannot do. So th that is our plan. We just can't definitively commit to it right now. Sure. Great move. Any additional comments? Oh. Sorry, go on, Dr. No, I, I'd like to say something. You know, as we were talking about the teachers and what they have done this year under circumstances related to COVID-19, and it has been very difficult for everyone. But um, I park my car um, in the back of the school, and I come through the restaurant every day. And I just want to commend Chef Prokrivki for how she has handled the virtual situation with her students. I've told her many times, you should have your own cooking show. <laughs> and she has been great. I, I, I shared that with Ms. Peterson as Sit well. But, but she has really been great in keeping the students engaged. And it's really been something to witness over the past year. So I just wanted to recognize her in front of everyone. I appreciate that, and I do I, I do take great consideration that the vast majority of us do come to the restaurant, and I cannot. Could you please get closer to the microphone? Oh, I'm so sorry, and I'm so short too. But again, <laughs> I just I wanted down. to thank everybody because I know most of you do patronize my restaurant, and the students do great work, and I can't. I I'm looking forward to the day that I have everybody back in, in the restaurant again. So thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. Thank you very much. We appreciate you all for being here. Can I just can I just say something else too? Is I've seen so many students that have showed up and in her class they found their purpose, they found their passion, and it's been great to see that over the years. Thank you, Chef K. Thank you. Next item, please. Thank you. Next item is citizen participation. Citizens wishing to address the board on agenda and non-agenda items for action can submit a virtual blue card that will be posted at 4 p.m. on Monday 7th, 2021 on the district's website, dearbornschools.org slash district slash board dash of dash education, or in person by 7, 10 p.m. by submitting a blue card to the board secretary. The board may not be in a position to respond to non-agenda items. Therefore, speakers should not anticipate an immediate response to their comments or questions. For the benefit of all concerned, Please do not mention the names of students or school district employees. Please keep your comments as brief as possible. The board president reserves the right to limit times. Mr. President, we do have a uh, physical blue card here uh, from Mr. Vascavaluna, who would like to address the board on the successful HFEC graduation ceremony. You've got a three-minute limit. <laughs> no, six, 60 seconds, I thought it was. <laughs> well, I don't see unanimity in that vote, so I'll just take the largest of that. Uh, uh, Mr. President, um, Dr. Maleko and trustees, thank you for your time. I come before you as the president of Henry Ford College and to congratulate you on what many of you all saw was a successful in-person graduation for the Henry Ford Early College and the Henry Ford Early College Advanced Manufacturing. Uh, I was honored to be there with many of you and to see graduates' faces in the flesh and family in the stands at your high school stadium at Dearborn High was personally very gratifying because it shows we're making progress back to what we all really enjoy as education leaders, and that is seeing education change lives and, and show young people what success feels like. I also want to congratulate you for the relationship that you all have historically fostered between the Henry Ford College and the Dearborn Public Schools from Dr. Maleko and his predecessor and myself and my predecessors. Uh, the community here in Dearborn is very well served, both in education, which is our primary purpose, but also in their pocketbooks. We talked about how much these students saved and their families saved as they moved on to four-year institutions with zero debt and in some instances 90 credits of college uh, uh, credit. I will finally say that uh, this, this can be, and Dr. Maleko I know knows more about this than I do, this can be the national standard for how P12 districts and community colleges really do lift up 
the citizens around them. And it's a point of pride for me and it's a point of pride I know for all of you. And I wanted you to know that I, I sing that to all the audiences that'll listen and uh, you all are one of them at least tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President tonight. And uh, I, I ask you to keep going with the relationship to, to any high school student in our area, not just Dearborn students, any student who wants access to college at a very, very um, affordable rate and at the highest quality, please come see us at Henry Ford College. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have virtual comments. Mr. Uh, Joseph Sikinerator, uh, he said, good evening. As a citizen of Dearborn and a teacher in Dearborn Public Schools, I'm horrified to hear about the plans of the board that has to pipe a feed from security cameras directly to, to the police. Has been over a year since the protests last summer about the over-policing the black community and other communities of color how the board could possibly miss the entire point of those protests as they happened and in some places continue to happen is frankly outstanding and extremely alarming. Our society idea of justice is punitive, vengeful, and often miscarried, but it does not mean that we should enforce this upon our students and families. Further, security cameras are a reactive way to address problems within schools and communities. The harm still occurs. All we have done is reinforce the school to prison pipeline. If we want our students and staff to be safe, we need to invest and practice proactive, healthy ways of harm reduction and conflict resolution within our schools. Of course, this requires more effort time and more money that is not a cheap and easy solution. But I and other citizens of Dearborn elected this board to do what is right not what is easy. Mrs. Loxy Portillo, she said, thank you for all your dedication to our children and the schools that serve them. Uh, my uh, position as a nurse and a mother of three small children is that the masks for children in elementary school should be required until vaccinations are available to them. I'm being asked to switch to a virtual program by a specific date. However, no one from any part of the school system, local principal, administrative secretaries, and the superintendent's office can tell me if masks are going to be required for elementary children and a decision isn't expected until the summer. I would like to know if the children in elementary are going to be required to wear masks for the upcoming school year until vaccinations are made available to this age group. The start of a school year with no social distancing and no mask requirement amounts to taking unnecessary risks with the health and safety of our children. All of the sacrifices that we have as parents, teachers, and students have made up to this point to keeping or to keep our children safe would be for not. Normal is not, there, is not here yet, hopefully soon. I fully understand the risk is lower in the general population because of the efforts of the community. However, the risk is not zero for our children. I ask that you put yourself in the shoes of the parent of the child who develops a serious complication from a COVID a month or two before vaccinations roll out. Ms. Amanda Chrysler of Dearborn said, good evening school board. I want to reach out, reaching a response regarding an agenda item for your meeting tonight. I may not have the time to hop on and speak, but I hope so. I'm very concerned and against the surveillance and criminalization of our students that adding police cameras in schools would open doors for. It is proven that policing schools primarily affects black students and can contribute to lower graduation rates and higher arrest rates among those students. Voting to allow extra surveillance of these students is giving them an additional disadvantage. I've included many articles sitting, uh, citing this and uh, how the proposed cameras would damage our students' irreparable. On top of this, uh, concerns about safety are unwarranted and unproven. 
and our nation policing schools has continually proven to be useless against real danger. In emergency situation, the likelihood of an officer stepping are slim to none. That is uh, statistical observation, which was taught to us at an active shooter training that I took for my uh, teaching position. As a taxpayer who moved to Dearborn specifically for the school systems, I would not ever be comfortable sending my child to a school that was a, in a police state of constant surveillance. I would especially never feel comfortable sending an adopted or fostered black child to that kind of school. Education should not be a place to set up children to be caught by police. The school to prison pipeline is real and giving this city's history with racism, we should not be pushing for more or uh, just and equalizing actions. Thank you for your time and cited a few articles for us to, to view. Mrs. Muna Mashrah of Dearborn says, I understand that the district and the board have been discussing placing cameras in classrooms with potential of giving feedback to police or feed to police at closed door meetings. If this was to happen, it would be a gross violation of trust and would lead to even more issues for our black and brown students. We need to stop the school to prison pipeline instead of continuing to expand it. In my opinion, there is absolutely no need for cameras in classrooms. Classrooms should be a safe place for students to make mistakes, grow, and learn. This would disproportionately be used punitively against our BIPOC students and families. Why would the district even consider such a decision? The money spent on our cameras and security contracts should be instead be used to increase social and emotional support, including adding additional social workers and psychologists, and provide these individuals with therapeutic resources to aid their work with students. Cameras in classrooms are unnecessary addition to our school environment. Uh, we also have a comment from uh, Ms. Asmahan Mushrah of Dearborn saying, I'm writing to you as a highly concerned parent and educator of Dearborn Public Schools. It has come to our attention that there have been discussions in regards placing cameras in classrooms that would directly feed to the police department. If this is being discussed with the plans to implement this, then it is deeply concerning and extremely harmful to our community. Not only does this infringe on the privacy rights of our students and teachers, this is another ha harmful way to monitor and criminalize our students, especially black and brown students. We all, we know all too well that school to prison pipeline is indeed real and unjustly affects black and brown communities. Our communities do not need a direct feed from the cameras to the police, regardless of the intention the impact is dangerous. It is a way to monitor thought and criminalize students. Our community has already experienced an increase in unjust monitoring programs after 9-11 in the name of safety. In light of unjust monitoring that is already done to Muslim and Arab communities, it is unfathomable that the district would even consider camera and face recognition technology in classrooms that would potentially wreak havoc in, on our community and be used to further criminalize us. Bringing these types of technologies into our classroom will continue to marginalize our community and place harmful tactics to be used against our students and families in the future. Why is this even being discussed? Our classrooms are safe, so do not use a safety issue as a response. If the intention is to help support administrators in regards to student behavior, then increase funding for social, emotional, mental health support, such as social workers and psychologists, instead of using it for policing of our students. Is it to monitor student, is it to monitor teacher behavior? If that's the case, you can continue to dehumanize and disrespect us as professionals in the field, which is insulting. Why are these meetings closed and not open to the public? As parents and community members, 
we have the right to know what and why things are being done in our schools and where our tax dollars are being spent. And these discussions should not be held in secret without the knowledge of your constituents. I will not give my consent to my children to be recorded and data to be collected um, to them, to myself in the classroom. I will send my children to school with the presumption that their classroom is safe or is a safe space for them to share and discuss ideas and thoughts, not for them to be monitored and criminalized through technology. This continuous monetization of students and staff is demeaning and should not be happening in Dearborn. Um, Oud Mashrah of Dearborn said, absolutely not violation of, st of student and teacher privacies and rights. Um, Miss Stephanie Butler of Dearborn says, informed consent is required for investigational medical therapies, regardless of the lack of safety and if Efficacy behind the decision to require a child to wear a mask, it is illegal to mandate EUA-approved investigational medical therapies without informed consent. Make use for viral transmission prevention is authorized for emergency use only. Emergency use and authorization by the FDA means the products are investigated, investigational and experimental only. The statute granting the FDA and the power to authorize a medical product of emergency use requires the person being administered an unapproved product be advised for his or her right to refuse administration of the product. This statute further recognizes the well settled doctrine that medical ex experiments or cr clinical research might not be performed on human subjects without express informed consent of the individual receiving the treatment. For this reason, I have taken my elementary students out of school until you come up to your senses and stop abusing my children. Uh, M. Meshrah of Dearborn says DFT staff and teachers were not informed or asked about their opinions on this video network with police contrary to what was said uh, any decision like this should be surveyed to the parents and staff. We should be informed and included and heard instead of having decisions made for us without any input from us. As a parent and staff member of this, uh, this type of decision makes us all feel like we are important within the district. And that's the, un the end of public comment. Next item, please. Do we want to make, obviously, there are corrections to those comments and that were said that will be cameras in the classrooms. So we want to make sure to set the record straight that this is not the case. Um, Very true. So um, next item is action item, special consideration for item. Uh, are there any agenda items on this agenda which board members or the superintendent wish to discuss and vote on separately? If there are, we will exclude them from the motion below. Any items that members would want to have excluded? I have a question, and I'm not sure if it's a mistake or uh, per perhaps the contingency needs to be... <laughs> Uh, cleared, and that's the item on busing. Which one was that? The busing contract. Was it going to be a question, or would you like the item pulled? Well, um, it's going to be a question. Hopefully, if it's a mistake, then we can okay. correct it. That's uh, action I item number nine. All right, so there's question on number nine. Any other questions on any of our action items? All right, uh, then if we move forward with the motion. Sure. M move that action items 1 through 20 um, be approved as recommended in this agenda. So move. Support. All right, we've got a motion by Trustee Petlichkoff and support by Trustee Barry. So, Trustee Mosip, you had a question on number 9. Yeah, so the contract for this was $2.7 million and there is a 3% increase for the next year. Um, 
but the recommended action is to say uh, not to exceed 3.1 million. So is there a contingency of 3% or the increase is 3% and then a contingency of 100,000? We added a little bit with uh, the summer school going on. Uh, transportation is going to be really busy, and we're going to we're going to need some help from the contractor. So we just wanted to make sure we had a budget here so we could take care of uh, the transportation needs for this summer, and then going into the next school year. So costs are increased prorated. So the contract three percent. Plus, we added a little bit more just to cover any needs. Now, this is just a budget. We don't necessarily have to go there um, and use it all, but we want to make sure we had a budget that would cover any needs we might need for the summer school this summer and then for the next 21-22 school year. We're still recruiting bus drivers. We are. We're working hard. We just recruited two. <laughs> Mr. Sotras in the Transportation <laughs> Department. Hey, but two. I'll take two. Two is a good start. It's better than zero. It's better than I going know. negative. It's better than, yeah, it's better than none. All right. And that's another good quote, Mr. Uh, Trustee Barry. Our contract with National Trails does give us a stipulation that as we recruit drivers, we can we take can routes back. back. Yeah. Good, yes. Yeah, thank you. Trustee Rose, have any additional questions that no, satisfy no, it? No, that was, that was good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Very we very appreciate well. it. Any additional discussion on any of the action items? All right, seeing and hearing none, if I could have a roll call vote, please. Yeah. Trustee Barry? Yes. Trustee D'Ambrosio? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Trustee Mozup? Yes. Trustee Petrskoff? Yes. Trustee Watts? Yes. President Thorpe? Yes. At this time, I'll be reading a summary of the agenda items. One, approval of warrants. Two, approval of award to Quaver ED, Inc. Three, approval of contract increase with Def Can. Four, approval of contract to D Shines. Five, approval of award to Cognia. Six, approval of award to Camp In Invention. Seven, approval of award to AARO Companies. A, approval of award to Superior Ground Cover. Nine, approval of award to National Trails, Inc. Ten, approval of award to Best Asphalt, Inc. Eleven, approval of award to Great Lakes Environmental, Inc. Twelve, approval of award to ALC. Thirteen to fifteen, approval of non-instructional and instructional personal items for Peter 12. Sixteen, approval of financial statement. 17, approval of 2021-2022 Board of Education meetings per order report 20-114. 18, approval of mode of instruction. 19, approval of donations. 20, approval of math coordinator. Okay, so I am going to uh, congratulate uh, Ms. Nadia Musa, who was just approved. I'm going to ask her to come up to the podium to say a couple of words and give her a big round of applause. We know Dr. Fitel, retirement, big shoes to fill, but we know you're up for the task, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yes. Good evening. Uh, Nadia Musa, teacher of Fortson High School for 14 years, also a Fortson graduate. So I'm super happy, super excited to be taking on this position. And I hope I do make the community proud and the Force and Feeder School is very proud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and good luck. And I'll be learning from the best. Dr. Fatal has truly got some very big shoes to fill. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I did work a deal with her. She, she's part of one of the liaison for my student advisory council. So she's going to stay on and do that next year um, as a coordinator as well. So, and if I could just mention, I know, um, Appreciate uh, President Cavaluna coming up and the great partnership there. And thank you to the board for pr promoting that and allowing us to have such a great partnership here between the college. Thank you. It's been great over the last several months to see the partnership between the P-12 and the college, including things like stepping in and helping out the early college students. Traditionally, that graduation would happen in the fourth of the auditorium, I mm -hmm. believe, right. over at yeah. the college. But due to COVID, we wanted to have an outside activity we were able to step up with the Dearborn High field for that one uh, and the P12 side has been uh, very nice to accommodate the college for the board meetings that had already been the last two months and we're about to have another one next month but uh, it's great to be able to have this relationship in our community next item please
Next item is discussion item with a 30 minute time limit. Policy updates, policy 7544, digital communications, 5341, emergency medical authorization, and 5342, do not recitate orders, DNR for minor children, Dr. Glenn Maleko and Mr. David Mustoni. It would sure be good if you didn't use that whole 30 minute time limit. <laughs> I have very little to say. <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. The uh, Board Policy Committee did meet and reviewed the policies that are being brought here for discussion. The one policy is an update. Uh, it is a do not resuscitate policy. It's a very rare instance that a student would have one of these. Uh, it is usually if a student uh, has uh, several other underlying health conditions and the parents put a do not resuscitate order into place. All this policy really does is it provides our staff with guidance to making sure that the parent clearly communicates that to our staff, the principals and our staff, and so that our staff is aware, and that if any emergency personnel show up on the scene, uh, they are aware. This policy was reviewed by our special education nurses and our special education uh, executive director, Mr. Mike Saley, uh, and they reviewed it to see if it kind of went along with you know, their policies or their procedures in handling things, and, uh, and it did. We already have a policy that mentions this. So the policy that we have, it only mentions it. There's only one sentence. We'd have to remove that sentence from that existing policy and then adopt this new policy that provides a little bit more guidance in detail. Any questions on that one? The other policy that the policy committee reviewed and was shared with all the board was a policy regarding digital uh, communications, uh, more commonly referred to social media uh, as social media. This policy uh, is, was, was the board had asked uh, that we uh, come up with a policy to help uh, in guiding our staff and our students. You know, we want to walk, you know, we have to be very careful because when it comes to allowing people to have their freedom of voice and have their freedom uh, of speech, we can't interfere and encroach with that. At the same time, we have, uh, just as any other company or corporation, has uh, rules and guidance in place that uh, staff members and students should follow uh, when, when, you know, uh, working as a representative of the Dearborn Public Schools. That's what this policy does. It doesn't give any, it's, it's nothing where it says you can't do this, you can't do that, it can't, you can't do this. What it does is give some guidance uh, so that people have an understanding uh, of, of what are acceptable behaviors when um, um, using social media and when representing the, the Dearborn Public Schools as a staff member. This policy has been reviewed by our HR department who deals with many of these types of issues and our student services uh, department as well and by our board policy uh, subcommittee. And the recommendations that we bring forward tonight are a policy and then a guideline that accompanies that policy that provides a little bit more uh, uh, detail to that. All of these inform all this information was shared with the board and um, I'm very happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Any questions on the policy? All right, continue. Thank you. The next step, we then will bring these to the board for a formal vote at the next meeting in accordance with your procedures for policy approval. Thank you, Mr. Mustnan.